After a couple of weeks within Beirut, I finally made my way north and east to the ancient Roman ruins of Baalbek, a place that I've wanted to see for decades. This is absolutely unbelievable. So, walking around Baalbek town after the sun went down, almost the entire town is dark. Uh, I'm walking along the ruins and there's a really, really good view of the stars because the city has no lights except for the handful of lights that stores are doing. And the azan from different mosques is echoing across town for the evening prayer. One thing that's notable is that the modern town and the Ottoman version of it abut the Roman and Phoenician ruins. Um, it's, yeah, really interesting just trying to walk around here in the dark. Good morning from Baalbek here in eastern Lebanon. I am trying to find the entrance to the site, which is not entirely intuitive. I had a guy trying to sell me Hezbollah t-shirts and another guy trying to offer me a taxi ride, which was, uh, a little strange considering I'm just on foot looking for the entrance. So hopefully it's here somewhere. Well, finally arrived in the Baalbek ruins after a bit of hassle and not being able to find the entrance right away. And wow, this is exciting. This, the scale hits you immediately. Loving the hellified gangster lean of this column. Just copping a lean on the outside of the Temple of Bacchus. Perfectly tipped over. These hulking limestone blocks were all fitted without mortar. And they're basically flawless. And look at the carving detail on this particular one. It's just, wow, there's just so much intricacy to how these were built. And you can see there's nothing, these, the blocks are perfectly fitted together. Look, there's not even, there's not even a gap here. The engineering is almost otherworldly here. It's so, so specific. Just the, the measurements they must have used. I mean, you can't, you couldn't even, you know, it's a bit of a cliche, but you couldn't fit a piece of paper in between here. You couldn't even squeeze in, say, an ATM receipt or something really thin.
The Roman gods to whom Heliopolis was built in honor of, Jupiter and Bacchus, were adapted from ancient Greek gods like Zeus, the god of sky and thunder, and Dionysus, the god of fertility, festivity, and winemaking. I believe that's where the term Bacchanalia comes from. There's a notable source material anomaly here in Baalbek. As you can see, the courtyard is almost all limestone block that was quarried locally. But then here, in this end, you have these stark red granite columns that came from Aswan in southern Egypt near the border with modern day Sudan. They were part of the Roman Imperium and thus were able to be brought here to Baalbek for construction of the temples. What nobody knows is exactly how these came to be here. How were they transported and what, what method were they brought out of Aswan to Baalbek? It's not impossible, of course, that they're here because you have red granite from Aswan in Italy itself. So, of course, there was a way, but I just am really wondering how. Something which I don't know if there's any explanation for is why you've got these gigantic megalithic blocks, but then underneath you have much smaller blocks. What was the reason for that? If you're fortunate enough to come to Baalbek, and you make the effort to get here from Beirut or come to Lebanon at all, considering all the crises, you definitely need more than a day here. I think you could easily spend three days here exploring, uh, if not a week, depending on how much you're interested in the ancient world. The place is simply vast. I believe it's about a hundred acres uh, worth of ruins in various states of disrepair. There's just so much to see here. There are several sizable blocks here in the courtyard that bear Latin inscriptions from Baalbek's Roman heyday as Heliopolis. And considering all the weathering and age, the inscriptions are in quite good condition. Though the bulk of the construction consists of finely cut yet huge, simple limestone blocks, there's also exquisite detail to be found in seemingly every corner of these ruins. This space here looks like it was meant for a statue of a Roman deity at the time. I wonder where that statue is today, but that almost certainly seems like what it's for. There's a pedestal even at the bottom. Just try and imagine what this place was like close to 2000 years ago with its sun cult that isn't understood today. Unlike the Abrahamic religions of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, for the ancient pagan religions, we call them things like the Roman religion or the Greek religion. We have such vague terms for these things. We don't really know what their practices were, exactly what their belief sets were. At the same time, I love the mystery of this place. I love the fact that we don't know. The almost abstractly large splendor of the ruins aside, there are also interesting little nooks where you can see that the ruins have been adapted to modern man. Here's a small door with a little padlock on it. God knows what's in there. An office? A storeroom? Who knows? There's a few of these throughout the ruins. It's a glorious day here in Baalbek, and I'm kind of sad to have to go back to Beirut but my time here in Lebanon is coming, I think, to a close. I need to move on to the next destination. And also the conditions here uh, aren't so great for hanging on for a very long time. The hotel is $20 a night. The guys are super sweet, but it's freezing cold and there's no hot water or electricity at night. Not necessarily complaining, but it doesn't incentivize me to want to stay longer. I think it would be better to visit here uh, in the warmer weather. So today I am going to try and skate to the Stone of the Pregnant Woman, which is the world's largest uh, carved megalith. And then I'm going to check out this Shia shrine on the way uh, back up into town. Then I hope to visit the ruins again before jumping in a minibus back toward Beirut. Bomb on a little hill down towards the ancient megalithic rock quarry. And it's funny, I'm, I'm trying to skate through the traffic and all the touts for the minibuses are asking me if I'm trying to go back to Beirut. 
despite the fact that I, I'm on my skateboard rolling and I don't have any bags with me. <laughs> this is such a cool, cool, interesting place. I definitely want to come back here. Wow, so here it is. I saw this coming into town, but this is the Stone of the Pregnant Woman, which is the largest megalith that was never completely carved out of the, the quarry. It is absolutely massive. Incredible. This thing has to be seen to be believed. If you see the man standing in front of it there, you get an idea of the scale of the stone. Unfinished here in the quarry. And it looks like it's so close to being done. It's as if the civilization had to abandon it for some reason. I can stand almost fully upright underneath the stone of the pregnant woman. Uh, there's a trench here to where you can see that the ancient quarrymen um, had been working on it and what is really really extra interesting is that next to it is the I'll crouch down here there's a bit of a trench this is the forgotten stone which was only discovered in 2014 that's less than a decade ago by a German archaeological team that's been working here in Baalbek for ages it's crazy to me that this forgotten stone I mean hence <laughs> the name of course the name is very is very apropos, but it, this was only discovered just nine years ago. Shows you, there you can see my skateboard on top of the Forgotten Stone to give you just a little idea of <clears throat> the scale of these Roman period megaliths. The stonework is incredible. So here is what the stone of the pregnant woman used to look like, I'm guessing before the 2000 14 excavation of the Forgotten Stone by the German team. What a difference that is. I think it actually kind of looked cooler the way it was, surrounded by grass. I've dreamed of seeing this giant rock. I can't believe that I'm actually here. I've wanted to see this for so long, and I finally just powered through and somehow made it happen. And if you love the ancient world, this is completely worth it. From what I've read about the site, it isn't known exactly why the stone is known today in Arabic as Hajar al-Hibla, the stone of the pregnant woman. I'm guessing it's owing to some sort of myth, something related to the Temple of Jupiter. Uh, I don't know exactly what that is. I don't think anybody does. If this had ever been completed, I guess it could have been the world's biggest ledge. I wonder who could get up on a no slide on that. You'd have to have some serious pop. And here at the end of the stone quarry is a little cave area, which I'm wondering if this is some kind of a workshop for the carvers. It's immediately cool inside this limestone. It looks like it could have been a bath. This looks like it could have been an altar for some sort of a deity. It gives you a great perspective on the stone. And here in the corner of the quarry look like there are a number of unfinished blocks that I'm guessing would have been for the Temple of Jupiter. So it looks like, which was never finished as we know, and yeah, it looks like there is a lot of a lot of unfinished work here. Here are two, here are two vertical blocks. Still standing upright after about 2,000 years. Noticed a kind of amusing juxtaposition here at the quarry, which is there's kind of a continuity with mankind never finishing large or even small scale projects, never finishing quite what he starts. So here you have as I pointed out, the stone of the pregnant woman, which looks so close to being done, but it's not quite there. It's not quite cleaved from the bedrock. 
And then across the road there, you've got what looks to have been an apartment block that maybe they ran out of funding, maybe the builders left the country during a war, who knows, but there's no construction equipment, there are no signs, no fences, whatever that is, is never going to be done. It's just a cinder block fort at this point. I just thought it was kind of interesting that these are in the same proximity. Now I am looking for the South Stone, which is not in the main quarry where the other two megaliths are. The man who ran the gift shop told me not to bother to look for it, but if I'm here, I feel like I need to see all three stones. This looks to be the remnants of an ancient quarry here. Oh, and there it is. There's the South Stone. Okay, so on second thought, I now get why the guy at the gift shop was saying maybe I shouldn't scramble down there. There are a pack of stray dogs down there at the bottom of the quarry, and they seem mangy and furious. And they're barking at me from all the way up here at the top of the hill. So, probably don't want to scrap with them. Well, I think this is as close as I'm going to get to the South Stone. Um, this area is partly an ad hoc rubbish dump for Balbeki trash, I'm guessing. Um, well, those dogs are barking like crazy and I'm so far away from them. The stone looks really interesting. It's got a, a piece of the top left corner is actually excised out quite precisely. So it looks like a part of it was maybe used for a temple while the rest of it was abandoned. And I bet if you were to dig around more here, you'd probably find other such megalithic um, edifices. This is, this is amazing. If I had more time, or maybe if I was in a car, it looks like you could probably drive down there. But I'm not going to make the effort to go down this rocky hillside. Well, that was pretty fascinating. Now I'm going to go to the Shia Shrine of Hussein's daughter. This mazar or shrine is dedicated to Sayyida Hawla bint Hussein. Sayyida designates a feminine descendant of the Prophet Muhammad. Bint means daughter of, and Hussein is the grandson of Muhammad, who was martyred in the Battle of Karbala in 680 AD in what is present day Iraq. It is said that his daughter, who was then, that would make her Muhammad's great granddaughter, um, was buried here. And this shrine was originally erected in its modern sense, I believe in about 1970, uh, but in the mid to late 1990s, funding came from Iran via Hezbollah to build a much more modern, uh, ornate shrine. Um, it's pretty interesting here in Baalbek. It's right next to the ruins, and it's quite a contrast between Baalbek's uh, sort of uh, pre-Islamic or, you know, pre-Christian history um, to its Islamic history today. Here on the grounds of the shrine is a modern day tile depiction of Imam Hussein with his Zulfikar, which is his um, double pointed sword, and a lion. One noticeable adjunct here at the shrine complex in Baalbek is the Museum of the Resistance, which is a museum dedicated to Hezbollah and its victories uh, against aggressors to its south. Uh, to my left is a giant poster of Sayyid Hassan Nasrallah, who is the Secretary General of Hezbollah. And to my right is a giant poster of Ayatollah Ali al Khamenei, the Supreme Leader of the Islamic Republic of Iran. Uh, the museum is closed today, unfortunately, but you can kind of see through the glass doors, there look to be sort of giant posters and dioramas and all kinds of um, sort of war souvenirs uh, from probably 2006, 1996, 1993, um, and so forth. Behind me is a giant map in Arabic of the early lands of Islam, and I believe this depicts the route after the Battle of Karbala when Imam Hussein was martyred in 680 AD, and his family were taken captive and strapped to camels and dragged throughout the region, which is how his daughter ended up here in modern day Lebanon. So if you look at the map, it shows Karbala in, in Kufa, uh, in the south of Iraq, 
and then the red line between the Al Furat and Tigris, the, the Tigris and Euphrates rivers, seems to trace the route of the women captives that were in Hussein's family and ultimately leading down to Sayyida Hawla's uh, final resting place where she died here in Baalbek. Um, this, is, this is quite interesting in and of itself. The cypress tree that stands in the middle of the shrine is said to be about 1400 years old according to local lore. It's, the shrine was actually built around the tree, it looks like. The ornateness of this place is simply stunning. It's cool and quiet. You can't hear any of the traffic noise outside. And upon entry, nobody asked me where I was from, my religious affiliation, my ethnicity, the language that I speak. No questions were asked. I just surrendered my shoes and my skateboard and was able to walk in. I love moments like this and places like this. That was quite fascinating. This is like a little piece of Iraq here inside eastern Lebanon. And I've been to a lot of Shia holy places um, in my traveling and reporting, and I'd never heard of um, Saida Hawla, the gr uh, great granddaughter of Muhammad. And I wasn't aware of this shrine, but I'm glad I made a stop here. It's beautiful and serene inside. Now it's back to the hot streets. And I'm going to try and see some more of the ancient Roman part of Baalbek before heading back to Beirut. No, something that's always fascinated me about Shia theology um, in its physical representation and its veneration of the imams of Imam Ali, Imam Hussein, Imam Abbas, and so on, is that it kind of resembles the Catholicism that I grew up with. Um, with, you know, I, as like Ayatollahs kind of remind me of popes in a certain sense. And, you know, in, in Sunni Islam, there isn't such a representation, of course, of the human form. And in fact, in Salafism, um, the ideology espoused by violent groups such as AQ and IS, uh, veneration of the human form, um, is to say it's frowned upon would be to put it lightly. Whereas in Shia theology, when I see the, um, the tile renderings of Imam Ali and Imam Hussein, it's something from a sort of a cultural sense I kind of recognize. Like when I see Shiism, I feel like I sort of get it. It reminds me a little bit of Catholicism in, its, in how ornate uh, and adorned its, uh, its shrines and mosques are. Um, in the same way like Catholic churches are um, in Latin Europe. And so there's something about that that kind of draws me to it in a visual sense. Plus, as a photographer, uh, I love the, 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 just the visual. From this little crevice inside the ruins, you can sort of see modern Baalbek. But I have to say, it was well worth coming back a second day, even just for part of a day to explore more of the ruins. Here, close to the entrance, I found this vertical chamber, um, which who knows what this was for. You can tell that over the years it's been, it's been worked on. There's actually some, this is some concrete work that's been done with bits of limestone, I'm guessing to stabilize this wall. And then here, there is, there's a whole, there's a, this doorway you can tell has been has been reconstructed. This is obviously machine cut. Oh. 
This lion head is a great piece of detail here, tumbled on the ground at the foot of the Temple of Bacchus. I'm thinking maybe this broke off from the roof up there. It's, it's just so rich in detail. Here, on the side of this piece, you can see there are these square-shaped holes, which I'm thinking were used to hoist pieces up to the tops of the columns. There are a number of these around this piece. In the background, you can hear the azan from the mosques in Baalbek town. I think one of the most incredible things about this site is that there's still no consensus about why it was so big and why it was so far from Rome. You know, why, why put so much effort into this site that's nowhere near what is now the Roman heartland in the Republic of Italy? That just, that's what blows my mind. It's just the sheer scale of the place. It's like, I think it's like nothing in the Roman Imperium. I don't know of anything that's bigger. So there's a museum here on the grounds of Baalbek, actually built into the ruins, but just been told by a local man here that it is not open owing to Lebanon's persistent power grid crisis. I would love to see what was in this place. You can see there's a modern staircase that's going up above the temple complex. It's a shame this isn't isn't open, but understandably so. I'm going to take you inside the sanctum of the Temple of Bacchus. As the afternoon wears on here, the light gets better and better. It's less of a stark contrast and more ambient. Walking out of the court of the Temple of Bacchus. And then you come out here onto the terrace and you can see what's left of the remaining columns of the Temple of Jupiter across the way. It's absolutely sublime. I noticed here on this very antique sun-battered sign that there is what looks to be a recent bullet hole um, which I'm guessing had to do with some kind of fighting, some sort of spillover uh, from the Syrian war. And a local man who noticed me looking at the bullet hole in the sign then pointed me to bullet damage on this, this column here. He showed me that some of there, there were some, some, pock, yeah, some pock marks here um, that were from crossfire. <laughs> strikes me as curious about Baalbek is just the name itself. So I believe that the name comes from Baal, 
which denotes the Phoenician god, who I think may have been the god of the sun. And Bek, I'm guessing, um, relates to the Wadi Beka or the Beka Valley, where the ruins here and the present day modern town are situated. The Romans called this place, however, Heliopolis, was something that they either borrowed or absconded from the Greeks who had preceded them. So it was the city of the sun uh, for the Romans. I just find that interesting because if you think about it, the town as we know it now, the name of it, it harks back to something that's actually pre-Roman. Uh, the Phoenicians were a civilization that far predated Rome in this region. And uh, I think that's something worth talking about or wondering about. It's, a, it's a, something that I'm questioning myself. Uh, this place is like a maze out of a storybook. Around every corner, every turn, there's something else. Here, finding this little stairwell, it's another, another way to get to the Temple of Bacchus. And atop here is a reconstructed mosaic floor that's been put into this giant alcove. And it's in fairly good condition, considering it's nearly two millennia old, give or take. Look at how perfectly flat the base of this column is cut. I mean, it, it is, it's absolutely completely level. There, there are no waves, no bumps. There's just, you know, wear and tear from, you know, sand, wind, rain, and just, you know, the elements over the last 2,000 or so years. But if you just, I mean, and look at the size, the diameter of this thing, and that it was, this was done with so much, so much absolute precision. Something that I think is really notable about the preservation of the ruins in Baalbek is that through everything that Lebanon has gone through with the 1975 to 1990 civil war and all of the other turmoil in the region like the Syrian civil war slash transnational war that um, has been going on since 2011 until the time of this recording, um, Something I think that has never really been much discussed is that, you know, Baalbek is purportedly essentially a bastion of Hezbollah. They, you know, the Lebanese army has nominal control over the checkpoints, but as far as I've always understood, the real power is in the hands of Hezbollah uh, here in the Beka Valley. And there is a sharp distinction, you know, some people in, in Washington at some of the, um, sort of the think tanks that are uh, very, say, you know, pro Likud or that toe sort of a, um, you know, the far right line as far as um, Middle Eastern politics goes. And they try and say that, uh, that the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps or that Hezbollah are just as dangerous, if not more so, than groups like Al-Qaeda and IS and the Taliban in Afghanistan. But uh, as someone who loves ancient sites, one thing I can tell you is that ancient, ancient sites like this from a pre-Islamic civilization are never under threat in areas that are under control of armed uh, Shia Islamist groups like Hezbollah in Lebanon or other similar groups uh, in Iraq. And that is really a marked difference. When IS destroyed the um, some of the temples in Palmyra in Syria at the height of their control, which was sort of akin to um, when the Taliban blew up the uh, Buddhas of Bamiyan in, um, in March 2001, it kind of to get attention and show how radical their ideology was. And to, they wanted to destroy anything from the time of ignorance, which is, which is anything that predates the, um, the prophecy of Muhammad, peace be upon him. Uh, and so, it's 
it's just really interesting to me. I feel like if this was in an area that was under control of a Sunni radical group, uh, it might not be here. You know, if it was a situation like in Mosul or in Raqqa or any, you know, when IS was controlling large parts of Aleppo and Deir Azor governates um, in Syria and Anbar um, and Nineveh governates in Iraq, all the sites that they destroyed, you know, the, the museum pieces, the temples. I mean, you know, aside from the human tragedy and the genocide that they put forth against the, the Yazidi people around Mount Sinjar, it just, it killed me to see those ancient sites being destroyed. These are places that I had wanted to visit since I was probably a teenager, you know, reading about them in a really old National Geographic that, you know, perhaps predated the Lebanese Civil War or the Iran-Iraq War. Um, and so I, I think it's uh, something that isn't really talked about in terms of radical Islamist politics here in the Middle East, you know, and there are, there are a certain crowd of people uh, who like to say that, you know, Iran and its proxies in Iraq and Lebanon and Syria are the real threat. But one thing I can attest to is that they're definitely not a threat to ancient sites. You know, here in this town, you have, you know, you have these Roman ruins that were built on top of, you know, a Neolithic site. And this is, you know, these were pagan uh, temples. They were cults. It's just, uh, it's something that I think would be a different situation if they were controlled by a radical Sunni group. If I were pressed to try and sum up Baalbek in just one word, which is nearly an impossible feat, I think I would say that it's overwhelming. That would be the word I would have to pick. The scale of the place, its sheer magnificence, it's, it's astounding. Just look at the height of this column here. I don't know how, how much that's, how much that's uh, relatable on this little GoPro camera. But I think the thing about Baalbek is that it stands as a relic of empire at the very edges of Rome, at Rome's peak. And empire and imperialism are often being debated in the Western context today uh, in terms of uh, you know, arguments over social justice and trying to rectify the past by changing language or tearing down statues. But what empires did was they built things. And they often, in the case of Rome, like the Greeks before them, they built very, very large things. And Baalbek is just almost a, a an absurd kind of <laughs> variation on that. And I think part of what this place is, is that it's a bridge from antiquity to the present that was left behind. One of the things I absolutely love about a day like today and a place like this is that I'm not thinking about anything else but this place in this day, in this moment. I didn't check the news this morning. It didn't hurt that the internet was out in the hotel and that the power was just off in general. You know, that definitely added to it. But I think that was sort of fortunate. You know, I didn't check what's going on, the latest of the war in Eastern Ukraine or what's going on with the culture wars at home or in the UK or Australia or wherever else in the Anglophone world. I don't know what's, you know, what are the latest memes that people are trading back and forth from one Manhattan office to another. I'm only thinking about this place in this, in this moment, and I'm grateful for this. I wish that every day of my life could be like this, and I'm happy to be able to share this with whoever might be watching. It's, this is the type of place that, you know, you come here, you will never forget for the rest of your life. It's not something you'll regret. It's a bit of a shame to be leaving this place, but I've got to move on to my next destination, uh, where there will, in fact, be more ruins from ancient Rome here in the Middle East, so I'm kind of looking forward to that. And so for now, I've got to get back to Beirut and say bye-bye, Baltic.